Hi, everybody. This is God Sad for the Sad Truth. I hope that I'm able to get through this uh, episode without coughing in your ears. I've been suffering from a very, very nasty cold and cough for several days. Uh, and so let's hope for the best. So yesterday, while trying to recover from my uh, uh, cold, I watched a um, documentary, a 2017 documentary titled Becoming Bond. Uh, on George uh, Lazenby's uh, life. Now, for those of you who don't know who, who that is, Lazenby was catapulted to worldwide fame when he played uh, James Bond in the 1969 film on Her Majesty's Secret Service. It was his only James Bond role, and then he somewhat disappeared back into oblivion. Now, I knew of uh, the you know that particular one-time James Bond, uh, story, but I never, I had never known why it was that he never played uh, another James Bond role until I saw the documentary, which I highly recommend you watch. It's it's truly riveting because it's uh, it's narrated. Uh, you know, there's an interview of George Lazenby himself recounting his life trajectory from his upbringing in Australia, then moving to England to pursue a love interest. And how basically things fell into his lap. I mean, if, if there ever was someone who had a the proverbial horseshoe up his behind, it is certainly Mr. Lazenby. Uh, things apparently came pretty easy to him uh, all the way to landing the uh, James Bond role. But in any case, what I thought I would do today is as I was watching yesterday's documentary, I noticed several snippets from his life that really spoke to some uh, evolutionary principles. And so I thought that I would uh, point these out uh, to demonstrate how ultimately the, the explanatory power of evolutionary psychology is truly limitless. We are biological beings that are shaped by the forces of natural and sexual selection. And so as you hear the life story of a, an individual, you obviously see the vestiges of evolution throughout one's life trajectory. So let me just mention a few of these. So number one, what is abundantly clear throughout the movie or the documentary is that he was able to seduce women with his extreme confidence and in many instances his persistence in sort of pursuing uh, the girl and wooing her. And so this sort of dual uh, forces of, of extreme confidence and uh, persistence uh, certainly were part of uh, the keys to his mating success. Uh, so just let me mention a, a few episodes that happened in his life. So his first major love interest, he had seen her at a party and she was this beautiful, uh, you know, high, very classy woman who was accompanied by another guy. And so he decides to approach her uh, as she is leaving uh, the venue with her suitor and tells her, I'm going to take you out uh, you know, soon. Like he said, next week. And he does this uh, right in front of the other suitor. So already that gives you a sense of sort of his, his chutzpah, uh, you know, the... the the, the, the confidence that he has to actually approach this girl while she is accompanied by another man. Now, some of you might remember a story from my personal life that I've recounted that actually uh, reminded me of what I saw yesterday in the documentary. Uh, I think it was on Joe Rogan that I mentioned the story. So for those of you who might have heard me you know, stating it, apologies for the repetition, but many of you may have not heard the story. So one of my brothers is a uh, former Olympian, a, a judo Olympian. Uh, he represented Lebanon in the 1976 Olympics. He's a uh, very, very confident uh, guy, even though, you know, you would think he's, he's sort of a, a short guy, but he, although he's built like a, uh, like a pit bull, very muscular, very compact. But, you know, he doesn't exude sort of the tall, dark, and handsome James Bond archetype. 
And uh, many years ago, uh, when I would visit him in California, he would, uh, uh, you know, challenge me to the following game. I remember one particular uh, instance when uh, we were at this uh, nightclub in Southern California where he lives, uh, well, where he's lived for many years. Uh, and the game that he'd want me to play with him, which I would uh, humor him reluctantly, is he would ask me to take my time and point to a woman that I thought was the absolute most beautiful woman in the club and the one that looked as though she's the most unattainable. Uh, and then he would take over from that point. And so he'd say, take your time and uh, let me know. And so this one time I started looking around and I wanted to not only look for a woman that was uh, obviously what appeared to be out of his league, but also someone who would have an obstacle uh, that would make it difficult to approach her, say a very intimidating looking man that she's with. And I found that woman. She was dancing uh, on the dance floor, uh, if I remember correctly, a slow dance with this big muscular guy. She was a gorgeous girl. Uh, and so I said, okay, there's, the, you know, I pointed to the girl. He says, are you sure? I said, yeah, let's see what you can do. And so my brother waits for the opening. He waits for the, uh, the, the guy that she's with to, I guess, maybe go get a drink or maybe go to the bathroom. And he takes this opportunity to approach her. And, and literally as he approaches her, he, she towers over him because she's a pretty tall girl. She's wearing high heels. Uh, you know, he's probably, I don't know, 5'4". And so you would think that the optics don't look too good. He starts talking to her. She giggles. She laughs. Uh, and then he comes back to me and with complete, absolute self-assuredness says, she'll call me tomorrow. To which I answered, absolutely no way. This is not going to happen. So the next day, we're sitting at his uh, house. And at the time, uh, you know, there were answering machines. I mean, actual physical answering machines. And so he goes, come, I want you to listen to something. And he plays the answering machine. And it basically says something to, to the effect of, you know, hi, David, it's Candy or whatever her name was. And it was great meeting you last night, blah, blah, blah. And, and then I guess eventually they got together. Uh, of course, he was a my brother was a very wealthy guy, he had many Ferraris, he had an Aston Martin, so uh, that certainly can give any man uh, courage. But the point of the story is that his sort of complete disregard for the difficulties of approaching a woman and his extreme self-confidence is so attractive that even a woman that otherwise appears completely uh, unapproachable, uh, he's able to approach her, get her, you know, and get her to call him. So I guess that's the first story of uh, George Lazenby, this, this sort of, this, this incredible over-the-top self-assuredness, this arrogance, this self-confidence that sends off cues that this guy must be the real deal to be able to be so self-assured. And there's another story that speaks to that. At one point, uh, George Lazenby is talking about, um, uh, you know, going on a date with that woman and they go to a river to start swimming and she starts sort of swimming away from him and trying to coax him to pursue her in the water. And then she says that, uh, you know, if he weren't able to keep up with her and catch her, uh, then, you know, there'd be no f romantic future for them. Uh, that, again, speaks to an, an evolutionary mechanism whereby females of many species will engage in this type of chase behavior to determine uh, who is truly worthy of their, uh, you know, of having sexual access to them. So that's sort of the first major evolutionary angle in George Lazenby's uh, life. Let's go on. So there's, some of you may have heard of the term hypergamy, which is, uh, you know, colloquially, uh, you know, using everyday words, uh, you know, marrying up. You have somebody from a low uh, social status who uh, marries somebody of a high social status. And you often see this in, you know, romantic tragedies, you know, where uh, a boy and a girl fall in love with each other, but, you know, he's from the wrong side of the tracks. Uh, so the classic example of this from the 1980s is uh, Pretty in Pink, where the male protagonist is this wealthy, social, high social class guy, whereas the girl is from the 
uh, you know the bad side of the of the train tracks so in any case in in this particular uh, story of in, in George Lazenby's life he is you know from a very low class uh, you know working family and at this point he is pursuing that girl that we've been talking about who turns out to be not only high class when he goes to her house the first time uh, he recounts an amazing story he her father is sitting there he says hi to him and next to him is this other gentleman and George Lazenby in com- you know complete naivete says to him oh my god you look exactly like the prime minister of Australia I don't remember his name and of course it turns out that that was the prime minister of Australia who was just sitting uh, at the, the girl's father's house. Uh, and so they came from, you know, very, very high society. And so in this case, what would explain that she would in the least bit be interested in him? Well, of course, there's a, in the mating market, there's often a trade, right? Uh, he's trading his low social status for his rugged good looks. And of course, a bad boy vibe, which uh, certainly at that stage of her life would have been an intoxicating uh, set of cues uh, from the perspective of uh, female uh, mating preferences. Uh, He was tall, he was dark, he was handsome. All of these things are part of the archetype of the fantasy of the ideal male, which of course is going to come back to serve him well when he ends up being chosen as a, as the, you know, the, to play the Bond the character. Uh, he was also capable, he recounts a, a story where he unleashed uh, very impulsively, you know, f- some physical a- aggression. And so, again, being someone who is physically dominant, physically reckless, who knows how to defend himself, who knows how to be aggressive, again, there are uh, certainly uh, many women who would find such a trait attractive. Of course, uh, such a man should never be violent towards uh, his love interest but the fact that he is able to you know uh, colloquial or or metaphorically wrestle tigers and you know put them in submission uh, that is an attractive trait that's exactly what you see in romance novels when you look at the archetype of the male hero in romance novels Uh, so we now have a bunch of uh, aspects of his life that really speak to these uh, universal evolutionary truths. Let me discuss a few more. Uh, He was a great risk taker, so much so that when he was uh, being, if you like, interviewed or when he was being tested for to play the, the Bond role and people asked him about his film background, he started lying about this. He started saying things like, oh, yes, you know, I've played in movies in uh, the Soviet Union and in Hungary and in China, thinking that, you know, he would construct lies that nobody could double check. And then when the film director finally interviewed him, he, he couldn't help but confess to his lies, to which the film director cracked up and said, you know what, you're going to be the next Bond uh, actor. Now, why isn't it that the director in this case, you know, why wasn't he flabbergasted by the duplicity of George Lazenby? Well, it's because, again, this ability to bluff, this ability to be cool, this ability to construct a a story that is very much uh, taking a great risk by lying about your past. Of course, I'm not suggesting that it is ever ever, uh, uh, something to condone to lie, but my point is that his being able to exude this type of confidence, this ability to uh, uh, lie and take risks and bluff is exactly what you then see in Bond movies where you see Bond, you know, typically uh, gambling, right? There's always this proverbial gambling scene where millions of dollars are being gambled and Bond is always so cool and relaxed. He's able, right, to bluff. He's able to uh, not allow anybody to read him. And that is part of his uh, intoxicating power. And so, again, I suspect that uh, something that is to be condemned, which in this case is that he's a, he's a liar, uh, ends up being something that is attractive to the one who is trying to cast him in the Bond role. Uh, but I guess probably the one quality 
that was the most uh, uh, the best way by which it helped him get the role is his I don't give a damn attitude. Uh, in French, there's a term, it's called mon fichisme, to, not, to basically not care, to walk around like you don't give a damn, right? Uh, now, the reality is he didn't give a damn. He was really plucked out of obscurity. Someone saw him, thought that he was handsome, gave him some, uh, you know, uh, modeling roles. That catapulted him to fame and he was started making a lot of money and that resulted in someone seeing him saying, gee, he's got sort of this debonair look to him. Let's bring him in for, uh, you know, testing for this uh, James Bond movie. The guy was not an actor. He never had a career in acting. Uh, he wasn't looking to be an actor. And so when he walks into these situations with the powerful uh, money men, the producers, the directors, the casting directors... Most people, even seasoned actors and actresses, are going to typically, uh, you know, be demure. They're going to try to, uh, uh, excuse the term, kiss ass. Well, he didn't, right? He was unbelievably arrogant in his I don't give a damn. Now, I argue, so to link it to evolutionary theory, I argue that this is really a form of Zahavian signaling. So for those of you who don't know what that is, let me briefly explain it. So if you look at the peacock's tail... The peacock's tail is very burdensome, right? It's, it's, it, it actually reduces the survivability of a peacock. It makes him more conspicuous to predators. It makes it more difficult for him to evade predators because it's more difficult to take flight when you have a very burdensome tail. But it's a costly signal because it is basically saying to the hens, the females of the species, look, despite the fact that I carry this big tail, here I am, I still survive. So the tail becomes a way for the hen to differentiate the pretenders from the real deal, the, the guys, the, the males that would be worthy of her attention. Well, this Zahavian signaling is in a sense exactly what George Lazenby was doing. I don't care, right? I don't care who you are. I don't care that you're a famous producer. And, and the fact that he could walk around with such bravado will make everyone feel like, geez, this guy must really be someone special to be able to pull off this kind of attitude. And it's precisely that that then results in him getting the role because that's exactly what James Bond is. He's this cool, macho, supremely confident, and here is this nobody who is exactly exuding all of those traits. Now, to end the story uh, on a sad note, the exact qualities that landed him the James Bond role out of the blue that catapulted him to worldwide fame they also served to lead to his demise, at least his, his film career demise. Because he was so arrogant about his self-importance that he ended up turning down a huge offer to play several more Bond movies. Somehow he thought, uh, you know, uh, he didn't want to do it. He didn't feel like it. He, he, he wasn't enjoying it. He, maybe he thought that they would uh, chase him more if he showed that he didn't care. Whatever... The reason, and by the way, he, he himself admits in the documentary that he doesn't quite understand his decision fully to this day. Uh, but the bottom line is that, uh, you know, it's quite it's somewhat of a, a tragedy that the exact thing that landed him the job, ultimately, the same set of traits uh, are the ones that uh, brought him down. So I highly recommend that you check out this documentary. I uh, hope you enjoyed uh, the, this ability to use evolutionary principles to really shed light on all of our lives. Why is it that we do X, Y, or Z? Why is it that we feel the emotions that we do, take the life decisions that we do? Not everything is due to evolutionary theory, of course, but many of the driving themes that shape our life trajectory are very much rooted in our evolutionary history. Uh, hope you're having a good week. I hope to get rid of this damn cold soon. Hey, I was able to do this whole thing without coughing once. Uh, thanks for your interest. Talk to you soon. Cheers.